Hello everybody and welcome to this week's From Theory to Practice where I take a look at the research so you don't have to. Now the article I've selected this week is a little bit different. It's called Impact of Mobile Digital Devices in Schools and it was published by the Center for Educational Statistics and Evaluation which is an arm of the New South Wales Department of Education. So this was kind of a government report. So what happens, and I'm sure you know this, is every once in a while government gets an idea, they send out a bunch of researchers to compile evidence, they use that evidence to then make their decisions. So here's the evidence they were going to be using to make decisions on mobile phone use in school. Now, review papers like this kind of come in two flavors. You've got what I like to call hunters, and you've got collectors. Now, imagine you're doing a review, so you're just looking through the literature, pulling out ideas, and you come across two papers. Paper A says something is good, paper B says that thing is bad. Here you've got a discrepancy. What hunters do is they bring that discrepancy together and they say, okay, why? Why would we get this discrepancy and what's the bigger picture? What's the connection and what does it mean as a whole? Hunters seek out answers. Those are the good papers. Collectors, on the other hand, they get paper A, which says it's good, paper B, which says it's bad, and they say, well, I guess we just can't make a recommendation. It's too hard. Those papers do my head in because literally they're no different than just doing a Google search and looking up evidence on your own. There's no real thought involved. There's no real use of your expertise to say, let me paint a better picture of this for you. Problem is you don't know if you're reading a hunter piece or a collector piece until you start reading the review. And bad news, this article is collector to a T. So, you're gonna have to forgive me because I'm probably gonna pop out with a bunch of interjections throughout this piece, but that's only because there's so little meat in this paper that it requires us to kind of step outside of it to make sense of it. So, all right, this whole paper was doing a literature review on the impact of mobile phones, so t cell phone device use in schools. And it kind of broke down into four sections. The first section was on cyberbullying. Now, here was one of the only things that I found really interesting about this paper. If you're anything like me, I assume cyberbullying is pretty bad. Turns out cyberbullying isn't even close to live physical or emotional bullying. So check this out. Amongst high schoolers in New South Wales, 15% reported being cyberbullying compared to 31% who had been verbally bullied or 17 who had been physically bullied. Amongst New South Wales primary students, only 8% had reported being cyberbullying compared to 35 who had been verbally and 21 who had been physically. So cyberbullying still ain't as big an issue as traditional bullying. It's just more of the same in a different guise. But then they dive into the research to say, okay, what impact does cyberbullying have in school? And here's what they find. Some research shows that cyberbullying happens more during school hours than outside of school hours, while some studies show that it happens more outside of school than inside of school. And because of this discrepancy, we really can't make any recommendations, so we're not certain about cyberbullying. Do you see why I get so frustrated by collector reviews? Find the thread, find the through line. Sure, some places might have cyberbullying more in school than out. Why? Why would it be different in different places? What does this suggest? And the very fact that cyberbullying is happening is what's at stake here. So even if it's only 1%, here's a behavior that's having impact on people. How, why, where, when, that's the point of a review. You've gotta be answering questions. It's not enough just to throw data out and say, well, too confusing for us, have a good one. Especially not when it's a government paper. All right, so that was the cyberbullying section. whoop de doo The next section then was on social interactions, and they did the exact same thing. So first they found a bunch of research that shows that over the last 10 years, social interactions between students has decreased significantly. So during recess, kids aren't playing, they're texting. But there's also a lot of research that shows kids use cell phones to keep relationships going with the people that aren't present. So when they're hanging out with their friends, they're texting their parents. And when they're hanging out with their parents, they're texting their friends. So because there's a good and bad, we're not gonna make any recommendations. You just found a very important finding. When kids have access to a cell phone, they choose to use that phone to connect with people who aren't live and present. This is when you dive into the research on the difference between live and digital relationships. Is there a difference? Does having a relationship, a one-on-one, -on -one, does being in the same room with someone confer any difference to talking to them on the phone? And if the answer to that question is yes, which it is, you then start to make recommendations based on this. If kids aren't interacting, if they're deciding digital relationships are more important, what are they losing because of that? What is occurring to their worldview, to their psyche, to their definitions of relationships? When you find a contradiction, you don't stop, you keep digging. And unfortunately, this paper doesn't do any digging. Which brings us into the third section, 
Uh, mental and physical well-being. Exactly what you would expect to happen in this paper. A lot of research shows that the more kids use cell phones during school, the lower their mental well-being is. And the more kids use cell phone in school, the lower their physical well-being is. They work out less, they feel worse about themselves. Cool. But wait a second, there is some research saying that you can use a cell phone to get therapy to help yourself feel better. You can use a cell phone to pull up a, an exercise regime to work out. And because of this, we're not gonna offer any suggestions because it appears there's good and bad. Let's just ignore for a moment that they just used the poison as a cure. Oh, you're depressed because you're using the cell phone? Why don't you use the cell phone to get undepressed? Why don't you just stop using the cell phone? Neither here nor there. But the point is, surely this should open up the next question. Okay, kids who use cell phones are more depressed and less healthy. They can use the cell phone to access programs. Question, are they using those? This is when you dive into the research that shows how effective are these programs? How often are people actually using those programs? To say that a program exists isn't enough, especially when you're making recommendations. You've got to keep digging and say, look, there is a workout regime online, but only two people have ever used it, so it's not effective against combating cell phone use. Ergo, we've got to see what we're doing with this. Which brings us to the fourth section, which is learning, and this was the only section they were very clear on. With distraction caused by digital cell phones, learning decreases. That's it. Anytime you act, put a cell phone into a room and it serves as a distraction, people learn less, remember worse. There's no surprise there. I think we've known that for a long time. Then this paper wraps up with its conclusions, and this is where it really threw me for a loop. So conclusion number one is this. We can ban cell phones from school, and evidence shows that when we do, the low achievers start to step up and equal the higher achievers. So the, the kind of the, the education gap starts to diminish. But then these researchers said, yeah, but there's a problem with that. Kids are really good at finding workarounds. So we shouldn't ban cell phones because kids will just find a way to use them anyway. Which is the same as saying we shouldn't ban smoking because kids will just go behind the bleachers and smoke anyway. Well, no, I'm totally aware that kids are gonna go sneak away and smoke, but that doesn't mean I want that happening in my classroom freely, available whenever they want to. So I don't see how they drew that bow, but there you go. So, okay, banning cell phones is out of the question according to these people. Which leads to number two, we have cell phone time. Certain periods during the day when kids can check their messages and text each other. And when would these designated cell phone times be? Largely during recess or lunch hour which is exactly the problem we're facing now. The problem we're having is kids aren't interacting. Their well-being and their health is going down because anytime they used to play and kick the ball, now they're on their cell phone. So your recommendation is do exactly the thing that's leading to the problem we have now. Okay, which leads us to recommendation number three. You could have cell phone times or you could just let it go. I mean, look, when you really get down to it, they're not doing anything too crazy in school. There's not a lot of sexting going on. There's not a lot of bullying going on. And really, we all use cell phones in the real world, so just let the kids go. This is how they're gonna learn. One wonders why there would even be a government inquiry into this if it were not an issue. And no offense, I'm an adult. I am horrible on the cell phone. I don't trust myself with it, which is why I turn it off and put it away whenever I'm about to teach. Because I've got full mature cognitive faculties up here and even I can't use this thing well. So just to say that, yeah, that's the way the world is supposed to be. Let kids learn it. Look, I'm not saying cell phones are good, bad, right, wrong. What I am saying that if you're gonna do a review article, please be a hunter. Don't just throw a bunch of papers together and say, here's the lay of the land. Honestly, anyone with a computer can go do that on Google right now. What we need when you do a review paper is to synthesize it, is to come up with a bigger picture, a deeper understanding, a more nuanced, here's why we have discrepancies and here's what the deeper story is telling us. I apologize for this one being a little soapboxy. I kind of choose articles based on their title with the idea that I'm just gonna come here and be with you guys, we're gonna learn it together. And, uh, and that, that, uh, that policy came back to nip me in the butt on this one. So I, I apologize, but there really was not a lot there. If you are ever asked to read that or take a look at that article, run away, run far away. So thank you guys so much. I hope you all are well. Uh, next week we'll have a better article, I promise you. I will see you guys soon. Bye y'all.